Jesus. I feel like sending you home. Now that was awesome. Praise be to God. That's how you do it. Everybody else is confused, but not the people of God. Everybody is afraid, but that should not be the people of God. Thank you, Jesus. That was absolutely awesome. Doesn't mean that we should not be concerned, but we do not have to be afraid. Amen. For the God of the mountain is still the God in the valley. When things go wrong, God will make them right. And the God of the good times is still the God in the bad times. And the God of your day. That's why you and I could be at peace today. Thank you, Jesus. Well, why don't we come down some? <laughs> Would you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Genesis chapter 49? Genesis chapter 49, reading from verses 8 through 10. Our God and our Father, thank you that you're not just a lion, <laughs> but the lion of the tribe of Judah. Today we look to you in all your strength to continue to lead and direct us in Jesus name. Amen. Well, you know that old serpent whom we shall not glorify today. Just give me a moment. Let me get back to 49. Where's my friend? Where is Pastor Balging? Oh, there it is. It's on the screen. I got it. I got it. Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Let's read it together. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. You have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion and as a lion who shall rouse in him was that verse 10 the scepter shall not depart from judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until shiloh comes and to him shall be the obedience of the people oh this is exciting my friends this is very exciting you see, lions are a very interesting beast. They call it the king of the jungle. But it's interesting that they would call it that because a lion actually prefers to be in low-lying places and they like grassland. Lions don't tend to move alone. They have a tendency to move in tribes, in prides. So they like to be grouped up. It's their way of intimidating when they come up on their prey. Lions are excellent at height so that they're able to jump at least 36 feet in height. That is a place that gives them somewhat of advantage when they see their prey. They jump high, jump high enough that when they come back down, they come down with enough force 
that by the time you're gripped, you're in a very tight place. Lions also do not do long distance runs. They do short distance, but at least 50 miles per hour. Lions also have a tendency to sleep up to 20 hours a day. While everybody else is trying to get about their eight hours, the lion sleeps about 20 out of 24 hours. So that by the time it goes out, it is overwhelmed with energy. So that when it hangs on to a prey that has already exhausted itself throughout the day, it's not a whole lot of work to take it apart. Lions also do their best hunting at night. As for the matter of fact, it is said that in certain parts of Africa, tourists are warned not to go out at a certain time. Because what lions do is they would come out at a certain time during the night and they would actually position themselves next to the doors of people's homes so that if people came out for a night walk, they would pounce. They carry a mane which usually speaks of their age. So the darker it is, the older they are. And that is one of the ways by which they exude their strength. That's why when they roar, they have a tendency to shake all that stuff like, I am in charge. So when we were told that in Genesis, Judah was to be a lion's whelp what the bible was really saying is judah who was that fourth son of jacob's relationship with leah he really was not in line to have received such a powerful blessing that blessing should have gone to his brother reuben but because those brothers had plotted against that type of christ which was Joseph. And Judah was the voice that cried out saying, don't kill him. Don't kill him. Let us sell him instead as a means of preserving his life. And so because of their wickedness, they were passed up for their blessing. I want you to know today that just because you were blessed 10 years ago when you entered your relationship with God or 15 years ago or 25 years ago or 30 years ago when you entered that relationship, once saved is not always saved. You could also cheat yourself out of your blessing. The blessing remains so long as you remain in the will of God and continue to do the will of God. So when those brothers plotted against Joseph, when the blessing was coming now through Jacob, they forfeited their place and Judah received that most powerful blessing because he was instrumental in preserving the life of his brother, the chosen Joseph. So I want you to know it is also very important that when some of us go about hurting the children of God without conscience, that we bring curses on ourselves. When we sit in our little councils and we take down people's character without cause, when we go about spreading things that are not true because somebody called us and we didn't have enough dignity to ask them not to gossip to us about people, And when we do not respect the people that God has called into his work, we also bring curses upon ourselves. It was also the voice of Judah when the brothers had gone down to Egypt 
and Joseph had sought to test their allegiance to see if they had changed. It was also Judah who had begged that he remained a prisoner while the brother Benjamin, whom Jacob still loved, would go back to his father because he did not want to cause any more grief to his father who had already lost one son. It was through Judah that Joseph realized that the brothers had actually changed. So when the time of blessing came that Jacob was being passed on and moving on to the final of his days, he looked at his son and he said to him, you are a lion's whelp. Meaning that you're now a young cub, but soon you're going to grow up. And when you do, it's going to be in great strength. You will be an intimidation to the nations and the people around you. In the same way that when God is at work in you, it will make people uncomfortable. They won't know how to handle you. They will go about, oh, every time I turn, she's doing something new. Oh, every time I turn, she, she has something else going. Oh, every time I turn, he's doing something else. He's not doing nothing and she's not doing nothing. God is doing it in and through them. Hallelujah. You can't envy a person that is being blessed. You wear yourself out, tire yourself out, and ultimately destroy yourself. That's what you'll do. Just like Saul. Saul realized that the spirit of God was in David and he was very envious of that. How are you going to be envious that God's spirit is in somebody? What you need to do is position yourself so you could get your dose of spirit too. Why you want to be upset that God's spirit is at work in a person? It's nobody's fault that you're not doing what you should be doing. You talk to God about that and say, hey, I'd like a dose too. Because if you continue to pursue a person that God is leading, what you're going to do is you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to destroy yourself. So when that time came, for that distribution of blessing. What Jacob was doing was predicting Judah's future. If you look at the history of Judah, they were the most successful of the tribes. They were indeed a great intimidation to the nations around them. You must also understand that he did not call Jacob just a lion. He called him a couching lion. Now let's take a look at that. The couching lion speaks of some sort of high intellect, great and excellent articulation, a form of wording and expression, which means there is a very high level of intelligence that is very different from a roaring lion. <laughs> you see, a roaring lion just makes a whole lot of noise. When I was growing up, my grandmother was raising five of her grandchildren. I was in that group and ever so often we would get, you know, very chattery and we were always talking and laughing and carrying on. And ever so often she would tell us things like, stop it. You talk too much. Empty vessels make the most noise. And that is true. You roll a full barrel down a hill and you might barely catch a sound. You roll an empty barrel, you'll hear it coming from miles away. And what we were really being told in this analogy of those two lions, the couching lion as opposed to the roaring lion, was that the couching lion had the ability to be used because of its great intelligence and intellect, unlike the roaring lion, which goes about just making a lot of noise. That's why first Peter said that the devil is like is like a roaring lion. In other words, that thing is empty and has no substance, only pretends to have power, but really don't possess anything.
any power. He is like a roaring lion, but he is not even a lion. He is only like a lion. You see, if you like the thing, then you're not really the thing. That's why Judah was not told that you will be like one, but that you are that lion. You see, Satan has a way of imitating. He's a master at counterfeiting. So he knows that God is that lion. So what does he do? He is like an imitation. Pretending to have some kind of power that intimidates. But the lion of which we are are talking about in Genesis 49 is a lion that acts in such excellence that when it goes out and pursues its prey, nobody could come up and resist it after its revenge and attempt to take that prey away from it. Now this is very significant because in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we are told that David, who is also a type of Christ, because Jesus came out of that same line, happened to have been taking care of his sheep, another type of Christ, a shepherd. And while he was doing that, a lion was forward and presumptuous enough, a roaring lion that is. And we are told that the roaring lion is our adversary because he is wicked and brings with him rampage and destruction. And that kind of lion, not a couching intelligent lion, went into David's place, took out his sheep, and took it in the claw of its jaw. David, being a type of Christ, pursued the lion. Remember I said to you that the lion of strength, when it catches its prey, nobody dare goes after it and try to take any prey away from it. But here it is that David did exactly that. He said, I pursued it and I didn't catch it from behind. I took it right in its face by the mane and I looked it straight in its eye and I reaped its jaws open and I removed my sheep out of its mouth. That is why the good shepherd said that should anybody come into his flock and try to take his sheep, he has enough power that he can go and pursue that roaring lion, get his sheep out of its mouth Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) He has that power to not only pursue, but to be able to remove what was said was impossible to be removed from the mouth of a roaring lion. So as the tribe of Judah went on in their successes as was revealed in Genesis 49. One of the things that we are to remember is that in that particular narrative, what Jacob was also saying is when you would have found your victories, when you would have pursued your enemies and every time you do that, you will be successful. Whenever you would have done that and you go after them, When you come to that place of victory, you will not be the kind of lion who will sit back in regret or would have made enemies all around you. You would be the kind of lion that would sit and be satisfied in your victories and still not having enemies. I don't know if you caught that. You see, after you war, you end up with enemies. When you go out to battle, you make enemies. What he is saying is, even though you defeated people, they will still be at peace with you. Because even they will know that you are coming to get what rightfully belonged to you. You will see your travail and you will be 
satisfied. That is why Isaiah 53 said of the Lamb of God that you would see the travail of your soul and you would also be satisfied. In other words, Jesus Christ would have been victorious in repurchasing sinners from the hands of the enemy. And when he would have done that, he would find great satisfaction. That ought to get you excited. He would look back and be satisfied. But you see, Judah did not always remain a perfect nation. Because Judah went out and was tricked by his daughter-in-law and ended up getting her pregnant. And that created a huge imperfection and otherwise many things into that tribe which ultimately even threatened going into idolatry. But it was very interesting that God would see it fit to allow his son to be identified into that very imperfect tribe. All because of a covenant that he had first given. Because God is a promise keeper. When God says he's going to do something, he does it. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. So that even when you and I misbehave, and we do. Even when we make mistakes, and we do. Even when we fail, and we do. Because of the promise that he has made. Promises like Hebrews 13, 5 through 7. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I will be with you even unto the end of the world. Those kind of promises that even when we have left because of his covenant, he still pursues. So he would identify that Shiloh would come through the tribe of Judah. Shiloh meant peacemaker or peace. Shiloh was the promised Messiah. Here was Jacob on his deathbed predicting that the line through that would come down through him is the one that would bring the Messiah that Israel had so long awaited. So when we come to Revelation, which is what we just read earlier, Revelation chapter 5, when the apostle John in his writing happened to be caught up in vision. And there he saw that there was a a scroll that was wrapped up and it was sealed. He wanted to know what was in it. As he looked at the whole process of the scroll, he began to weep because there was nobody worthy enough to open the scroll. And that deeply grieved his heart. It mostly grieved him because he knows that if something is sealed to that extent, then there is something in it that is very vital and extremely important. And he wanted in the vision to know the secret. Just like there are some people who desire to know the secret of God. But in a minute we'll find out why not everybody could get the secret. But he has a reason why. Do you tell everybody a secret? We tell our secrets to people we trust. We tell our secrets to people we are close to. We tell our secrets to people we know will not betray it. We tell our secrets to people we can confide in. Yes, it is true some people have betrayed our trust. Yes, it is true some people have not kept our secrets. But when we told them the secret, we intended that they would have kept the secret. So when John knew that that thing was sealed, he was weeping in great agony because he realized that there is nobody who was worthy to open that scroll. Now who would be worthy? It would be someone who was perfect in power and perfect in wisdom. There was no such person, not in heaven and not on the earth and not beneath the earth. Here's what that means. That could not have been in heaven, even though the angels were now living in harmony with God, despite the original rebellion. 
Because they didn't know anything about having to submit to the will of God because they had eternally and forever lived in submission. Well, it could not be on the earth because you and I both know we do not honor or serve God through perfection. And it could not be beneath the earth because that speaks of the devil and his rebellion. And we all know that he did not live in harmony with the will of God. So who would it be? If they couldn't find someone in heaven, and if they could not find someone on the earth, and if they could not find someone beneath the earth, who would it be that would be worthy to reveal the secrets of the scroll? And as John was getting very distressed because he wanted to know what was in it and if it regarded the future. Just like today, everybody wants to know what's going to happen next. People are very obsessed with the future. People want to know how much more time we have. Will I go to college? Will I get married? Do you see anything in the stars and pay thousands of dollars for people to tell them blatant lies? Because these people don't see a thing. Because when you see things, you should be able to just make calls and say, look, they're going to do that tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. You might want to evacuate the people. We should be able to get those notifications with so many psychics and fortune tellers and all those people. We should not be in the chaos that we're in. We should be consistently updated on what is happening and how to protect ourselves from it. Right now we should know where every person who is in the field of um, terrorism, we should know where they are and go find them. Nothing should be left to speculation with that many fortune tellers all over the place. And we knew that when we saw what happened with Nebuchadnezzar when he had that dream. For years he had employed those fortune tellers and foreseers to come and tell him what was happening in his life and in the kingdom. And for years they took his, they were on the payroll had benefits, retirement funds, 401k, and lying to that man for years until God find a way to let him know that they're just eating your money. Because when he finally challenged what they really did know, not one of them was capable of speaking into the future. And it is for that reason that John was so grieved. He was concerned that if no one was worthy, we would never know the secrets of the scroll. And then finally in the vision, an elder, I don't know if it was the first elder, the associate elder, or the second elder. Because now you know we have several numbers of elders. First, second, third, a half, associate an associate to the associate. I mean, the list just goes on. So I'm not sure which one of them showed up to console John and to say to him, my brother is back. It is okay. We found somebody. <laughs> We found somebody who is worthy. Oh yes, we did. We found in someone perfect understanding. We found in a man perfect wisdom. But not only did we find perfect understanding and perfect wisdom, we also found in a man one who was totally obedient to God, even to the point of death. He followed God all the way. There were no defects in his character. Character. He never sinned against his father. God could trust him entirely. I want you to know that Jesus Christ is worthy. The only one who is worthy to open the scroll and to reveal those secrets. If you are not in tune with God, he cannot reveal his secrets to you. That's why in a message with the disciples, he said, the things I say to you, I don't say it to them. The secrets of the kingdom is revealed to those who live in harmony with God. The reason why Jesus was worthy to 
open that scroll is because he had been obedient to God in all perfection. He had completed the entire wheel of God. This is why we cannot say things like, I don't have to go to church in order to have a relationship with God. That is a demonic concept. Because even when you work from home, you still have to go to the office. And it is very ironic how quickly we abandon the church. Now I'm not saying that the church is perfect. I'm not saying that the people in it is perfect. I'm not saying that you have not been hurt. Because guess what? I've been hurt too, a lot. The list is so long, it could take me an eternity to tell you. And so was Jesus. But he never left the church. You see, throughout our lives, we get up every day. Some of us have been in our professions for as long as 20 years. And they've done all kinds of things to us. They've passed us up for promotions. They've lied to us and about us. But we get up every day very faithfully. And no matter what they do to us for 20 years, we continue to get dressed and go to a place where people are constantly looking down on us. And maybe you have a great job. Maybe that is not your story. But at least one time in the time that you have been there, I am sure there is at least one thing that happened that hurt you. But you didn't leave your job because you thought about your paycheck and your benefits. We come to the church. That's why you don't leave, because you have great benefits. Your 401k, you're about to retire in five years, and you're not going to leave that. Well, how about Jesus is about to come, so you can't leave that? We go up every day, and we show up. Good morning, boss. How are you, boss? Mwah, boss. Can I get you coffee, boss? Tea, maybe? What can I do for you, boss? Are you okay, boss? Boss don't care about you, don't even like you, but you got to do what you do to keep your paycheck. You're going to kiss up on somebody, you do that to Jesus. Because your benefits are limitless. Your coverage is tremendous. You are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Your 401k won't ever be tampered with because you are fully covered. Full coverage, full comprehensive. You could never go wrong when you're employed by Jesus. When you stay with Jesus. When when you hang with Jesus we are too quick to abandon the church I was on a plane one time heading to Michigan and everything was going well I used to love to fly I don't feel the same way about flying anymore well <laughs> let me correct that I used to love to travel and fly in an airplane I myself have never flew anywhere it would be nice you'll get that later Everything was going great. Plane was smooth, sky was blue, and then suddenly, boom, air hostess began to dance. The little cart with my little soft drink left. Everything went down the aisle, and people are holding on, and brave men and strong men are crumbling because we thought we were going to crash. And I saw all the exit lights came on, but guess what? Not one person went to that exit. Oh, we held on, we held on, we had that thing so tight. Every exit light is lighted because they did tell us when we boarded in the case of an emergency and we happened to go very high. We want you to pay attention to the exit on this side and the exit on the other side. But no matter how bad it got on the inside, nobody exited because it was not the right place or the right time to jump out of an airplane. I say the church may not be perfect but don't you ever hit an exit during a turbulence you stay right where you are if they talk about you in the back shift your position go to the other side if you come up front and they talk about you go to the other side whatever you do do not exit during a turbulence 
That's when you hold on. Amen. Because no matter how bad it was in there, it was still worse out there. So that's why this afternoon, the lion of the tribe of Judah is still the lamb. That's why Isaiah said when we get to heaven, the lion and the lamb. Because in Jesus are both of those characteristics. You see a lamb is a follower. A lamb is submissive. A lamb surrenders. When I was growing up, we used to have goats. You do not want to care for a goat. After school, we had to go get them, untie them from where they were, and take them home. A goat will lead you all the way. You are never leading a goat. That animal dragged us all over the place, pulling here and pulling there and jamming here and jamming there. You go get the sheep. You pick up the goat from the time you pick up the goat. It was a travesty. It is why God didn't call you a goat. You're a sheep. Like your daddy. This afternoon, the lion, the conquering lion <laughs> of the tribe of Judah. That's your daddy. The lamb of God. That would take away the sins of the world. Oh yes, my friends, he is worthy. Who is worthy? He is worthy. Perfect in wisdom. Perfect in will. Perfect in character. Perfect in his confidence. Perfect in his obedience. And we ought to be like him. So if you're here this afternoon. And God is moving on your heart. To not take for granted. Those blessings that await you. I want to encourage you this afternoon. Not any other afternoon. To put your trust in the lamb. In that couching lion. That intelligent lion. That wise lion. Not that roaring, intimidating, fake and phony lion. That's what Satan is. He's intimidating but it's not real. He's like a lion, but he's not a lion. But your God is the lion. Hallelujah. So if you hear, still not walking with the lamb. We don't have a lot of time. Very quickly. Don't take forever. This appeal is for you. I'm going to ask you to stand because I want to pray for you. I want to ask you to follow the lamb. Because if you don't, you're going to be on the side of the goats. It's your choice. You could be a sheep or you could be a goat. It is your choice. If you're here, never been baptized, never entered a relationship with God, never made that true commitment, never gave Jesus your heart, please come. We just want to pray for you. If you don't want to come, stand. We have many of you we know that are already making that decision to follow God. We do not want to prolong this. We have a very long and packed day. God is calling. Where are you? You could come or you could stand. Whatever is comfortable. Would you do that? Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. God is not afraid to stand for you. So do not be afraid to stand for him. Even though you stood last night, we had an altar call and many of you came down. It is okay. You could still stand. Let's do it as an encouragement to the others. Anybody for Jesus? Anybody for Jesus? One person, two people? Anybody for Jesus? Where are you? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We have one for Jesus. Is there another one for Jesus? We want to pray for you. Maybe you have wandered. Maybe you have strayed. Everybody think that everything is okay with you spiritually. But you know that you are struggling. Maybe you want to recommit as you watch the world going down to its end. You want to be counted amongst the righteous of God. Are you here today? Recommitment. We want to pray for you. Is there somebody else for Jesus? 
Is there even one more person as I pray? I'm about to pray. Will anybody join this brave gentleman as he takes his stand for Jesus Christ? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, God. Is there another person for Jesus? Is there somebody taking their, their place on the side of right and the side of the strong? Say you are my king, you are the lamb, the lion of Judah, the seed of Abraham, the only one, God's only son, say you are the king of who I am. Is there anybody for the lion? Anybody for the lamb this afternoon? Praise God. Praise God. Friends, I want to pray, but I do not want to leave you out of the prayer. Would you let me pray for you that God would put you on the side of right, give you the strength that you need, the courage that you need. Thank you, Jesus. They're standing, my friends. Let's give a hand for God this afternoon. God is changing lives, shaping lives, moving lives, turning things around. Thank you, Jesus. Make sure everybody has a card, Bible counselors. Make sure everybody has a card. Take their names we want to pray for you is there even one more person for Jesus where are you I want to pray but I don't want to leave you out would you let God come into your heart so that he could leave and abide in it free you from your struggles your troubles your hardship anybody on this side for Jesus is there anybody else on this side is there anybody else on this side for Jesus? Hug the voice of Jesus calling. Who will go and work today? We have somebody else back there. Is there one more person on this side for Jesus? Praise God. I'm going to pray for you. Feel free as I pray. If you're impressed to stand up or to come forward, that we would pray for you. Oh God Almighty, the lion of the conquering tribe, Oh God who sees us in our weakness. Although Judah became an imperfect tribe, you God saw it fit to make your great entrance into the world through that very tribe. An indication that despite our imperfections, you are still able to do great things in and through us. So in the power and might of God today, like you, the lamb, we want to live in submission and surrender. And we ask that you would give us the courage and the strength to walk in that very spirit we ask. Bless all those who have stood indicating their commitments. This is the time. Now is the accepted time. And now is the day of salvation. I pray that nobody would harden their hearts today. Bring us back this afternoon for the rest of your empowerment. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I'm going to invite the other Leons to just come here briefly. I need you to tell our brothers and sisters who have responded to the appeal the time and the place where the bible instructors will be meeting and also the assistant pastor will be meeting with them Christian greeting brethren all those who have responded affirmatively to the appeal and who would like to recommit or commit for the first time to the Lord we will be meeting during lunchtime downstairs in one of the rooms while we are having lunch your the opportunity will be given to you by the pastor and myself and some of the Bible workers to ask questions 
and you, your questions will be answered in a Christ-centered fashion. Please meet us downstairs in the room. We will direct you where after you receive your lunch and we will meet with you to answer your questions and to help you by God's grace develop a deeper commitment with the Lord. Thank you. Shall we all stand at this time? Closing him, 506, a mighty fortress. We will sing the first stanza and the last stanza. Let us pray. And now, Father, may your presence be with us as we leave this place. May your Holy Spirit continue to empower us as we reflect upon the words we have heard. And now we ask that you prepare our hearts to as we go out right after lunch to do your biddings in the community. Bring us back at 5.30 as we begin the discussion of healing in our nation. And keep us here until after that discussion, when we shall hear another message of empowerment and salvation coming from your daughter and servant, Pastor Josie Ann Frampton. For we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ our Lord, that the church say, Amen. Amen. Let the 
Thank you. 